Um, I'd like to start just by thanking the organisers, all the organisers, for setting up this conference and for inviting me to give this contribution. And I'm very honoured to be here. Thank you. So, um, at the very core of archaeology, at the very heart of the archaeological experience, is um, discovery, the process of discovery. And um, really this is um, uh, something that uh, without discovery, without the emergence of evidence, there would be no production of knowledge. We would just be reproducing old ideas uh, and so on. So we, we need discovery, but where exactly does the act of discovery take place? Well, I used to think that I knew the answer to that question, but that was a long time ago, before um, computers really infiltrated into archaeological practice to the extent that they have done today. So um, I guess that um, I, I'm revisiting my old way of looking at things uh, and, and then coming back to how things are today. Um, so I, and I'm kind of taking an overview of that shifting ground that, that was referred to by, by um, Usa and uh, Tonya. So, it's not, not changing. So, so um, 30 years ago, I, I carried out uh, an ethnography of archaeology. Was it really 30 years ago? It seems hard to, to believe. And um, I, I worked on a Bronze Age ring ditch and cremation. Sorry. It's okay. And I, I specifically went to the site, although I was an archaeologist, I went uh, as an ethnographer. So I took up an ethnographic stance on, on the archaeological practice that was taking place. Um, at, that, at that time, it seemed fairly straightforward to locate what I called the act of discovery. So to me, it took place um, between subjects and objects, if you'd like. So you have the archaeologists working away at the material. But the other part, thank you. That's great. Um, this one? Don't worry about the text. So what I just need to go back with uh, that one forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's great. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So going back to um, 30 years ago, and uh, the ethnographic study that I undertook back then. Um, this picture here, you can tell how long ago it was taken, that there are several clues to, to the kind of age. For, for a start, it's film photography, not, not digital photography. For another, the th theodolite that the uh, archaeologist is using is uh, not an EDM. There's nothing digital about it. Um, for a third thing, there were no such things as drones back then. So to get that kind of view looking down on the site, we had these uh, giant photography towers, which um, were really nightmarish to build and uh, quite uh, scary to climb to the top of. So um, I only dared to go up there once. So I wasn't really taking this disembodied view, looking down on, on the action below, like a kind of tennis umpire. Um, 
But I like this picture all the same because you can see, first of all, the, the evidence itself. And in the background, you can see the ring ditches and some of the cremation pits round about. But also, there's the archaeologist there. Uh, and in one of his tools, the theodolite, he's planning some of those uh, features. And um, also there is the shadow of the ethnographer himself, which is me. I'm the one holding the camera. What you can't see are my knees knocking together because I'm a bit of a coward and I'm not very good at heights. And it took me a lot of courage to get to the top. But um, so there we are. I was actually very far from being a detached observer. I saw myself as a participant observer. So I was very much in the thick of the action, so to speak. And um, just looking at the material evidence itself here in this picture, that this was really the most fascinating area to study the production of, our, of scientific knowledge. You've got to remember at that time, so this was 1989, 1990, um, the kind of books that were around then and that I was influenced by were things like uh, Laboratory Life by Bruno Latour and Walgar and uh, The Manufacture of Knowledge by Karen Norsatina, that, that kind of thing. But, but it seemed to me back then, and it still does now, that studies like these were all about um, the, the work of the scientists themselves. It was very human focused uh, and there was um, very little about the material itself which somehow has an independent existence of human beings uh, and, and existed before humans came along to investigate it. So it seemed to me also that these were all about acts of inscription and very little about the more practical events that precede inscription, if you like. So in many cases, the material evidence that scientists were investigating in the lab and which the ethnographers were writing about that kind of interaction, the material was little more than a speck on a microscope slide. It was really infinitesimally small. And compare this with an archaeological site where, as an ethnographer, you can, um, you can go out and, and you can see that the object of investigation for archaeologists is part, part of the landscape itself. Instead of just being a tiny speck or, or the track of bubbles in a bubble chamber, it's, it's a very ground or surface on which archaeologists stand uh, and walk around. And, and indeed, to investigate it, we often have to dig into it, to probe into it, to, to uh, jump into the holes we dig and explore it from the inside, as it were, instead of looking at it as an object from the, the outside. So really, there are tremendous opportunities here, and still are, actually, for, for ethnographers of science and of the production of knowledge to, to uh, go and work in this kind of environment. And um, just to, one, one of the things I also noted about uh, the, the scientific work by, investigated by Latour and others was that the, um, the object that science, scientists were dealing with was very highly refined. It had already been prepared before scientists got to look at it in the lab. Whereas here, on a, an archaeological site, um, the, you can actually get to those moments before where the material is being... Um, where these chunks of material are being extracted from, from a larger body of material evidence. So here, for example, you can see uh, a cremation vessel being lifted out of a, uh, um, a burial pit and taken back to the lab for further 
analysis. And you can get to even further um, backwards in time to um, events that took place before that, events which I regard as quite um, original or, or almost primordial in the construction of knowledge. Um, so, so here we have an archaeologist emptying out the fill of the burial pit and uh, following the cut of the side of the pit along. So the pit itself is just taking form. It's, it's not yet uh, a fully formed object. Uh, and the cremation vessel itself, is, it's still coming out of the ground. So it's not yet fully visible. And part of it is still buried and, and, and hidden. So it's kind of in the process of emergence itself. And note that the, uh, you can see on the ground the kind of swirl marks that the trowel makes on the ground. And these are the marks of the agency of the archaeologist herself. And, and at this stage, um, at this kind of primordial stage in the process of discovery, the agency of the archaeologist is all mixed up with the emerging material object itself. So you can't really separate the two like we can at later stages of analysis. And this is what I call the act of discovery. So, or that's what I thought I would call the act of discovery back then. Um, it's the what I call, it's the, I defined it as a practical transaction between an archaeological subject who's working, who's engaged on the evidence, and a material object which is emerging or unfolding from the ground and in the process of formation. And um, the archaeologist is in direct contact with that object as it's forming. So she's shaping it with the trowel, sculpting it really. But at the same time, there are, um, the object is shaping the archaeologist too. And I'll perhaps talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, whereas in the lab, in the scientific lab, you have this tremendous array of um, scientific equipment pipettes and test tubes and machinery and various kinds of apparatus. Out on site, you don't really find that, or at least you didn't back then. So um, these are what I would call the tools of the trade, if you like, that, that are used for bringing these objects into the world and, and um, for helping to, to help them form, so to speak. So it's certainly true that we shape objects. We shape them with tools like these. And also, we shape them cognitively uh, with our ideas and models and um, assumptions and theories about the past. But um, it's also true that the emerging object, as it's coming out the ground, shapes the archaeologists at the same time. So it's got a kind of resistance to it. And we all know how awkward archaeological evidence can be, how sometimes it refuses to fit within what we want it to do or what we think it is. But, but it's kind of more than that. It's actually got like a, a material force or agency of its own. And um, even as it's being shaped, it's kind of contradicting or confounding our expectations of it. And it can surprise us and challenge us. And, um, but it can also reshape our, our bodies as well. So it's kind of building up the muscles in our, in our arm, if you like, or in our shoulders and our, our back. Or alternatively, it's, it's knackering us. It's doing it a sin. It's affecting our knees and our backs 
and everything. And I always think that you can recognize a field archaeologist by their, by their gait and their posture. And, and they kind of stand out, to me at least, because I've worked with them for many years, as um, you know, slightly d different, because they've been shaped by the stratigraphy. And uh, that this applies not just physically, but mentally as well. So um, in dealing with strata, they, they present uh, the patterns in the ground, present you with problems to solve, pra practical problems, which have like an intellectual dimension to them. And, and in sorting these out, um, in digging your way through those problems, you're literally developing kind of new n neural networks in your brain. So we, we are shaped by strata, we, we're shaped by the evidence that we deal with, even though we ourselves are shaping it. And uh, um, it's very easy, I think, to fall into the view that knowledge is being constructed and to forget that in that process of construction, the material evidence is having this active role uh, and that, that it's, it's not just a passive thing, um, receiving our actions and not in any way acting back. That's not the case at all. And out in practice, you can see that very clearly. So I hope you'll bear with me while I talk about this site a little bit more. And then I'll, I'll come on to talk about the changes that have happened since then. So as a, an ethnographer, I, I map the site. And um, what you have here are the various features that showed up after the site had been stripped by machine. And the circular features are uh, ring ditches, so there, there were, it was quite a large cemetery. But when you take up this view as an ethnographer of archaeological practice, you see other things that are significant too. So for example, the, um, the network of planks that are laid out on the ground surface, which change from day to day. The, uh, the situation of the, the huts, uh, the photography towers, and uh, the spoil heaps as well. And also the various tools that the archaeologists are using. Not, not shown here because they're always moving around, but uh, very much in the field of vision too. These are all parts of an archaeological site. And then there's the ethnography itself. And I used uh, the map as to map the interviews that I did and the sequences of interviews that, that I carried out with workers. And, and I made this decision, I think, to only carry out interviews um, on site in the presence of the material evidence as it emerged from the ground. So one could go and do an ethnography of archaeologists like in the dig house or in the planning hut or the tool hut or wherever. But I focus very much out on site because the act of discovery to me is this interaction between material evidence and the, um, the active shaping force of the archaeologist and the kind of dialectical relation that develops between the two. And I developed a way of recording the material field. I've often thought of turning this into a kind of context sheet that includes archaeological evidence and the archaeologists that, that um, are working on it. So here, for example, we have a ring ditch that is in the process of coming into being. It's not yet fully formed, and it's cut or outline, which is shown here as a dashed line, um, is still being followed along. It's still becoming an object of archaeological knowledge. 
and you can see two workers engaged in working upon the field. Uh, I called them A and D. And the sketch shows their situation within the material field. And it shows the direction they're facing as if looking down from above. But also, and most importantly, the direction that the material field itself is unfolding as it's being worked. So, and I think that's crucial. And the material field doesn't unfold kind of all at once. It comes in the short bursts, and it occurs in that practical zone of um, attention immediately in front of the body, um, in, in front of the workers concerned, who are shown in this sketch. So I'm going to use the, these uh, uh, sketches to illustrate, to tell you a story, if you like, of how the material evidence um, itself shapes the actions of the archaeologist and, and positively and actively shifts digging strategy. Um, so uh, I arrived to interview the worker on this site. I called him B. And uh, I called them all just by letters, just to protect their identity, so to speak. Um, and he was working on a, a, a ring ditch, and he'd already delineated it, and he'd excavated it. So it was, the ring ditch was like a fully formed object. But he was telling me how he'd been working away on, in quite a tight corner of this part of the site. And... Um, this stone had been sticking out of the section and uh, it, it had been really annoying because the stone was, every now and again, would scratch his thigh. And uh, this happened all morning and um, eventually he just got really annoyed with it and he got hold of this stone, pulled it out the section, which perhaps he shouldn't do. And it turned out to be a beautifully formed, uh, barbed and tanged arrowhead. And um, this was a surprise to him because he didn't think that the, fit, the, the soil from which the arrowhead came was actually um, archaeological. He thought it was natural. It was a bit mixed and, and a bit dark, but he assumed it was like a, a, a root hole or an animal burrow or something like that. So when I returned to this, part of the site a day or so later. The material field has changed. He's extended it to follow this uh, uh, evidence along. Um, on the prompting of the arrowhead, the arrowhead has literally pointed him towards this feature. And it's the second ring ditch. And coming from the ring ditch are other objects, work flints, um, uh, the, the, the waste material from from making flint tools. And um, I think what the uh, story illustrates is that um, although this is an exceptional circumstance, uh, objects, archaeological objects, don't normally draw blood and actually stick into us physically uh, like that arrowhead did. But it does all the time impact on us, and we're all the time adjusting what we do out on site to um, at the promptings of material evidence. It's not just us shaping it. And it's that dialectic that all the time, it's like the golden thread of the act of discovery. It's easy to lose if you just focused on the material itself. You would lose it. If you focused on the so social life of the diggers, you would lose it. But it's the interaction between, that's going on between the two. And it all takes place uh, to a large extent in that, as I say, that practical zone of activity immediately in front of the body. OK, so now I'm going to shift to a very different um, mode of working and a different working stance as well. So the archaeologists, it was all happening down there. So they're kneeling down on the ground, 
And in that cascade of soil under the moving blade of the trowel, objects and patterns are emerging. Um, here it's very different, but so you've got like an archaeologist, perhaps looking at aerial photos or satellite images, looking for archaeological features. It could be you or it could be me. And um, they're, they're, they're working away. They have the screen in front of them. They have printers and cables and computer equipment all around. And th their hands are busy with the mouse and the keyboard. But it's, it's like totally different. But they're in that practical zone of attention, immediately in front of the body you've still got patterns emerging and disappearing again, kind of opening and closing, uh, coming into the foreground and going back into the background. But the difference is that they're, they're on the screen and, and they seem to be of a different order of reality. But as we all know, they have a, a kind of reality very much of, of their own. And so, um, in 2011, I was working on a, a book about what I called archaeology of flow. It, it was really looking at the archaeology of rivers. And, and as part of that, I carried out a sort of mini ethnography of an archaeologist at work on a computer. And um, it seems to me that once you've done ethnography, you know, if you're an archaeologist and you carry out an ethnographic study, you never quite lose that perspective and you can always sort of go back into it again. And uh, so in this particular case, there was uh, an archaeological researcher looking at rivers and um, she was investigating um, an area of something like two or three hundred square kilometers. So still that practical zone of attention immediately in front of the body that we dealt with out in the field. But the, the whole scale of it has changed completely. And, and yet so much is different and, and so much is the same. And uh, so my aim was to write a kind of thick description to use uh, an expression of Clifford Geertz, who's an anthropologist of the archaeologist at work on the computer. I won't read this out, this is just to illustrate what I was trying to do. And one thing that was very clear to me in doing this was that the, the archaeologist at work on the computer, looking for um, artificial river channels and trying to distinguish between these and, and the natural river channels, all of which had silted up. Um, this was an embodied performance on her part. We tend to think of computer operators as somehow, um, and archaeologists using computers, that as somehow being passive observers of what's on the screen. But actually, this isn't the impression I got at all. There, there's all the attributes there of uh, craft practitioners, just like you find out in the field. For a start, it's very skilled spotting these channels. It takes uh, months and months of practice, and you have to get your, your eye in. But there's also um, the hand-eye coordination involved. There's the dexterity of movement. You know, it's really amazing watching the finger movements and so on on the mouse. And um, she's very much in touch with the equipment and arguably through the, the equipment in touch with the images and landscapes and representations on, on the screen. And um, I, I used to believe that the act of archaeological discovery only takes place in relation to uh, actual archaeological evidence that, you know, discoveries made on aerial photos, for example, 
could only be pale shadows of the actual act of discovery. But um, I just never imagined that satellite images could be so detailed that hidden within the detail you could literally kind of excavate by drilling down into it. Um, patterns of evidence which were completely hidden before. And I, I never imagined either that computer representations of evidence could, um, could surprise in the same way that um, more tangible materials do when you start to actively engage with them. So I was completely wrong. And um, I just watched in amazement as all these kind of features came to, the, uh, to her attention just really quickly over and over again. This is in a single afternoon. And she's kind of plotting them and deciding which ones are going to be focused on and so on. And we have to bear in mind that there's a connection here with what happens out in the field because what, what she finds on the screen, she's going to um, direct the attention of field archaeologists to. And they're going to go out and actually look at these. Uh, on, on the ground, a uh, small proportion of these. And uh, it seems to me that there's this same kind of dialectical relationship developing that, that I was dealing with out on, on site. It's not really that, that different. That the structure of archaeological discovery is, is all there, that she's really discovering stuff on the computer. And uh, so partly as a result of this, my view had changed completely. And I've bec become convinced that a general rethinking of archaeological discovery is necessary. Um, it, it's probably obvious to people here, but to me it really did come like a kind of revelation through doing this ethnographic study. And uh, that you don't have to be working out on site you don't have to be in physical contact with the actual materials in order to be engaged in the process of discovery. And I think this is the power of doing ethnography, that especially when it's applied to your own field of activity, because I'm an archaeologist, basically. It can change your view of reality and fundamentally restructure your perception of the world. And um, consider the work of, um, this is uh, an archaeologist called Sarah Parkat, whose work I find particularly impressive. She works on Egyptian landscapes. And uh, she uses uh, satellite images to um, taken from satellites which are really orbiting at a distance of about 700 kilometers, you know, really long way away. And yet they're picking up this, these landscapes of, of such incredible detail. And um, Parkak discovered no fewer than 17 pyramids, 1,000 tombs, um, upwards of 3,000 mud brick houses and a large part of the street plan of the ancient city of Tanis in Egypt. And uh, I kind of wish I'd been there as an ethnographer, but of course there's always the opportunity to go and look at these kind of acts of discovery taking place. Um, that they're, they're really quite common now. And what, what she did, she took two satellite images of the site, one low resolution but multispectral, and one um, black and white, but higher resolution. And she put the two together, and she said, well, this is what she said. She said, I thought I was hallucinating. An entire ancient city leapt off the screen. And uh, here were details of houses, streets, and suburbs, the layout of the largest, most continuously inhabited city in ancient Egypt. So again, we have the scale of discovery as truly 
uh, incredible, and we're moving here towards a kind of Anthropocene scan, uh, where we can actually study archaeological evidence, not just in a, a, a trench and, and in detail, the detail, the detailed evidence before us, but um, we can look at it on much larger regional, almost on a, a global scale of analysis. And um, or consider the work on tell sites in Mesopotamia. So archaeologists like Jason Ur or Menzies discovered 9,000 new sites within an overall area of 23,000 square kilometers. And um, this is truly a discovery on a, on a huge scale. So the they're making a map of archaeological sites within an area so vast that it would take surveyors years just to cover just a fraction of it. And the key here is that human activity leaves this distinctive signature in the ground. So all that organic material and the, the decayed mud bricks and so on makes the soils reflective and you maybe can't see it so easily from the ground, but you can see it in satellite images. And the really extraordinary thing here is that um, part of the work of archaeological discovery is actually being delegated to computers. So here's another thing that I was surprised about, uh, and my assumptions were, were kind of um, questioned by, that I thought that to be in an act of discovery, there, there has to be a human there somewhere. But, but it seems this isn't the case, that algorithms have been developed to um, identify these anthropogenic soils and, and to indicate where these uh, tell sites are. So computers, at least in this instance, have been programmed to do much of the work of archaeological discovery. And all, all this poses kind of ethnographic conundrums as well as archaeological ones. So here we have a quote by anthropologist Marc Auger. And um, he, he's really articulating an assumption that I had too about the nature of ethnographic reality, the very ontological ground of ethnography itself. And he's saying that all ethnology presupposes the existence of a direct witness to a present actuality. So anything remote from that direct observation is not anthropology, according to Auger, and I would have agreed with him. Yet in my ethnography of human-computer interaction, the ethnographer and the ethnographic subject are direct witnesses not to a present actuality but to this virtual actuality on screen and the landscape encountered and explored isn't the actual landscape it's it's a kind of highly packaged and and shaped version of the landscape um, and yet discovery is still taking place so you can see that the computer challenges the, the ground of ethnography just as much as it does that of archaeology. So the shifting ground referred to in the title of the, the conference refers not just to shifting grounds of archaeology, but really to ethnography and the study of archaeological knowledge generally. And the question arises if the act of discovery has partly shifted its location into digital space. Should ethnography follow it and shift its own location too? Okay. I borrowed this from the Chattel Hoyuk site, and it shows uh, a scene from Chattel Hoyuk um, on Second Life on the computer. So. 
But I'm not going to talk about that. I came across this great paper by someone called Julia Gillan, who was looking at visual literacy amongst teenagers. And her ethnography was carried out on Second Life. So she went on to Second Life in the form of her avatar. And she interacted with the avatars of the teenagers. And she engaged with them in various discoveries and adventures in looking at shipwrecks and finding buried treasure and that kind of thing. And this was all in that simulated 3D environment. So, again, this is from Chattelhoyer, which I borrowed off the internet um, website. But, but I would argue that actually all archaeologists and, by definition, ethnographers of archaeology are actually already that we may not be on second life, we may not be in the form of our, our avatar, so to speak, but we're already kind of toggling digital realities, digital technologies are so intermeshed now and have infiltrated right into the very heart of the act of discovery itself. That ordinary archaeologists and ethnographers of archaeology are having to um, a kind of toggle, as it were, between what we thought of as our em embodied material reality and um, that this other order of reality that, that's on screen. And we're kind of working with both. They're both part of our composite re reality. And it seems that computers and global networks of communication are increasingly embedded uh, alongside spades and wheelbarrows and bits of string tied onto nails and things like that. As everyday constituents of contemporary archaeology, subsumed into the ontological ground of archaeology of discovery itself and changing that, that ground. Um, and I'm not saying that there are no friction frictions or, or no fault lines between these two different kinds of reality. Clearly there are, and I guess we'll probably hear about some of those in the papers that follow. So I'm really coming to a conclusion now, and uh, what, what I've been talking about in this paper, I started off in the past, my old ethnography way back 30 years ago, and I've kind of come forward into uh, the future and so much has changed, you know. Archaeological practices, um, that act of discovery out on site is still there, but it, it's different, it's been altered by digital technologies. Uh, I think we'd all agree that that's, that's the case. Um, so the point is that the ground, as we come into the future, and we hear about from your papers, about how you see the situation now, the point is the ground is shifting and its structure is changing all the time, partly as the result of um, these rapid changes in technology, which actually archaeologists uh, are as quick to take up and indeed to develop as almost any other um, discipline. And I think that's what makes this conference so exciting. Because just looking at the abstracts of the papers, many of them uh, seem to almost like take for granted these new ontologies, these new grounds of being. And um, certainly they situate themselves on that, this kind of shifting ground. So um, I think these new ontologies, changing ontologies, will find expression in the papers that follow. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing them. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hedwell, for the stimulating paper an almost poetic approach to the act of uh, uh, discovery. 
Uh, are there any questions, remarks, comments? Yes, please. Thanks so much for a very, very uh, intriguing and uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, keynote, uh, Matt. I mean, the, the thing that really struck me very, very much is your comment about the subversion of this uh, temporal cohesion of uh, ethnographic observation and uh, the fact that uh, now, through the virtual and through the digital technology, some of this unity of time is broken down and uh, we look at stuff that really transcends different stages of, yeah. of, uh, of a debate. So I'd like to invite your thoughts on how, uh, in the very same way we see through the digital, uh, the subversion of the integrity of space as well, through the multi-site ethnographies, all this kind of thing, which things happen at different places at the same time, as at the same, uh, at the same uh, space as well. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, for me, it's uh, largely a matter of scale. I mean, clearly there are many uh, transformations of space, but the, the most uh, incredible is the, the kind of scale that computer technology allows us to work on and um, how the act of discovery is almost like um, jumped onto these other levels of scale. So, for example, um, I'm also involved in discussions on the Anthropocene and um, there are acts of discovery taking place on archaeological evidence on scales which were inconceivable before. So you can almost like, because uh, of satellite technology, because we have so many um, satellites in orbit, in stationary orbit around the Earth, we have this view of the planet which we didn't have before and indeed of archaeological evidence and, and uh, what, what, what its, its role in ecologies and, and so on. And none of this was possible before. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I tend to see it in terms of scale. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, questions? Uh, please tell your name before you speak. Um, uh, good afternoon, Professor. My name is Anna Cruz. I come from Portugal and uh, I am a digger also. I just would like to answer, ask you um, a very simple thing. Um, although we have so many digital uh, resources, uh, if you were obliged to choose, would you choose old school <laughs> or would you choose to let the digital resources work by themselves? And how would you feel to interpret all these uh, uh, da uh, digital data um, as you did when you w w worked old school? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, to me, it's not a question of either or, I don't think. That um, I, I would never want to give up the experience of digging out in the field and that direct contact with material. But neither would I want to uh, give up the opportunities presented by uh, computers uh, and uh, computer analysis for, um, and really the two are complementary. Although, of course, I understand that there are uh, frictions between the, the, the two things. But um, really, I think we are very fortunate now to be at a juncture where we're beginning to understand how that these digital tools are, are affecting all our, our practice and we're beginning to come to a view of archaeology that fully incorporates um, the digital in, into its mode of being. So we're no longer talking as I was back then about 
as just being diggers uh, that the act of excavation was so important, I thought, and, and I argued that. But now I can see that the situation has changed somewhat and um, really at a fundamental level, I think. And uh, so, so I wouldn't give up either. But thanks. Another question. Tell us your name, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Allison Mikkel uh, from the United States, uh, Lehigh University. Um, so I was really struck uh, towards towards the end. You said that um, it was uh, an, a, a revelation is maybe the wrong word, but um, a surprise to find that humans didn't have to be present for the act of discovery. I thought that yeah. phrase was really striking. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you could speak about the role of expertise in this transition to the digital, where like, uh, like how we read stratigraphy and how you hold the trowel and all those things. Like, there's a learning process that's quite specific, I think, to excavation and challenging for some students. Um, I'm wondering how you could how expertise factors into the digital uh, act of discovery in archaeology. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, expertise is crucial whether we're talking about digging out on site or um, working at a computer. And what's often forgotten, particularly in relation to computer work, is that it's a kind of embodied knowledge as much as an intellectual one that's, that's being used. We're, do we're doing this work kind of with our bodies, with our hands and our, our eyes and, and so on. And the discovery is taking place it may be on a screen, but it's still in that field that we're connected to, admittedly through all these chains of technology. Um, we're directly connected to those through what we're doing with our hands. So the levels of expertise and kind of craft knowledge are surely crucial in all archaeological work. And uh, in the example I gave of the uh, researcher working on the computer, looking at rivers, um, she's, she's using experience there, derived from working on rivers out in the real world. So she knows about rivers and so on. So all that's coming to bear in what she's doing. But she's also got this uh, knowledge of GIS and um, all the other um, kinds of software. And, and um, experience of working with big data and, and so on. And archaeology seems to be a field where all these things can come together. Uh, and it's something, I think, to celebrate about our field very much. But you're right, we must never forget that what it comes down to in the end is this craft knowledge, this embodied expertise. Um, so. Thank you for that. Uh, hi, uh, Gavin Lang from University of Brighton. So not too far away. <laughs> um, so you, you were giving the story of um, the arrowhead and how the archaeologist, when finding the arrowhead, kind of reacted and, and changed, and, uh, and so the material affected his ideas. Um, did you find with the archaeologists working with the rivers and on screen, was there any of this kind of interaction where the digital materials, uh, where, for example, she might have spotted something there and maybe changed one of her methods? Is that, is that active reaction, is that happening as well? Um, yeah, thank you for that. I see exactly, I see exactly what, what you're getting at. I mean, Computers are now there. Um, not, not all archaeological excavations use computers on site because there are obviously problems with the, the wet and, and dust and so on. But they increasingly are being used and certainly for surveying. Um, and, um, and also photography, 
and so on. And, and so to that, to that extent, computers and uh, digital tools have become part of the archaeological toolkit. They're part of the tools of the trade, so to speak. And um, they're mediating our transactions with the emerging objects. So all the time, they're feeding into the process. And uh, for sure, what's observed on what's being worked on on a computer screen is interacting with what's emerging from the ground. And again, it's like a two-way thing. So it's, I would say that um, where archaeologists are used to using with th this equipment, it's fully integrated um, into the act of discovery and has become part of the structure of it itself. So it's become part of that uh, sort of feedback loop that's going on between the material and the archaeologist and mediated by the equipment itself. Which, uh, and, and so the computer is there right at the heart of it all, if you like. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, Matt. I, I love that. Um, I've got a question which is probably picking up on two of the questions before. Um, I'm also interested in embodied practice, and I'm also a digital and a virtual archaeologist. And the examples you used about the last one, especially about the, uh, the river specialist, had knowledge of the rivers, virtual. But what's actually happening is a lot of that knowledge is being outsourced into cognitive artifacts, and I know we're going to pick this up later. Um, but in that one sense, that's being fossilized, whereas you've reviewed you, your view of the world, and that expert might review their view of the world. That process information is being condensed into a digital f workflow. And I was just wondering if you had any views on, it's coming back to the question before about uh, uh, what do we feel about outsourcing the processes of archaeologists into a technology? Right. Um, yeah, I think you, you quite rightly point to some of the dangers of this new technology as, as we assimilate it and it assimilates us, so to speak. And um, with rivers in particular, um, I mean, I wrote a book on the archaeology flow about rivers and, and I, I felt ambivalent towards computers because I'm able to see that, uh, you know, being able to zoom out to look at the river as a whole from source to sea and, and to explore interactions between what's happening at high up on the river and then further downstream what's happening on the delta. A computer is fantastic for that and you can shift out in and out of the different scales so easily. But for actually, um, it's so easy to lose that, um, that sense in which you actually can get immersed in a river, you know, the materiality of, of it that isn't on the screen. Uh, and uh, I felt that um, it would be possible to get lost in the computer representations of the river and never actually go swimming in it or go out on a boat and, and that's so important to actually feel the flow of the river and the currents, you know, to feel them physically as well as to see them represented on the screen. So I'm hoping that in a funny sort of way that answers your question because... Thank you. Other questions? Please. My name is Eric Paler. I'm uh, at the University of Massachusetts in America. Um, thank you. This is a wonderful talk. And I, I wanted to just ask you a simple question, but might be very difficult, which is in, in which ways, as you've talked about the subject uh, power, the, the agency of objects, in which ways do you see the digital object as having a different form of agency or a different manner of interacting with us uh, that maybe you think we should be aware of as we shift on these grounds? Um, that is a difficult question. You're right. 
But in many ways, the digital object is like a material object um, in that we're inc increasingly encounter encountering them in some form of virtual reality where we can potentially at least touch them or um, interact with them in physical ways, certainly in embodied ways. So looking towards the future especially, um, many of what I was, much of what I was saying about what I called physical material evidence as it emerged also applies, I think, to digital objects. Um, it's just that we tend to think of digital objects as being, uh, you know, in some way static uh, uh, structures and representations, but um, increasingly they're becoming much, much more vibrant things, I think. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in the future, definitely, I think, will be interacting with these objects in pretty much the same way. But, but then the, I'm kind of drawing a distinction between digital and non-digital, which probably is ceasing to exist. So it, it's going to be difficult to entirely separate the two in the future, isn't it? Um, I'll perhaps end on that question because I'm not sure I can give a complete answer. Really.